the main trade is Bitcoin and is is uh, is altcoins. I think that's that's the main uh, Trump trade, and and we've been talking on in, in the pod here for for quite a few months. I prefer ETH and Sol over Bitcoin on a on a Trump win than than Bitcoin itself. Sorry, Maxis, it's just common sense to me. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Bits and Bips, exploring how crypto and macro collide one basis point at a time. I'm your host, James Safer, TradFi Archmaster, Lord of Bloomberg's End, here with Joe McCann, Lord Commander of Asymmetric and Master of Bank, alongside Alex Kruger, Kruger Macro of House Asgard, Protector of the Realm. We're here to discuss the latest stories in the world of crypto and macro nudes. Just remember that nothing we say here is investment advice. Please check unchainedcrypto.com slash bits and bips for more disclosures. Today, we're also joined by Jeff Park, Master of Alpha, Warden of House Bitwise. Today's episode is brought to you by Gemini, a US-based crypto exchange built for new and advanced traders. Gemini is offering new customers $15 in BTC when they trade. Sign up today to earn your Bitcoin. Where can you find $700 million in real-world assets, 11 million daily operations with industry-low fees, powered by 450,000-plus on- and off-ramps across 180 countries? The Stellar Network. Jeff, why don't you uh, give a little background on who you are, and then we'll, we'll get into some of the topics of the day. Sounds great, James. And what a lovely title to kick <laughs> off my day. I uh, appreciate it. <laughs> my name is Jeff Park. I joined Bitwise about three years ago to augment their capabilities on having alpha strategies in-house. And so the main function that I run is our multi-strategy solutions. Uh, but also I come from the lens of TradFi, like many of you, and the ways to appreciate crypto into the dialogue. So super happy to be here. Big fan of all three of you guys, of course, in the space that I follow for a long time. And Joe, I thought this might be the perfect occasion for me to wear my anagram hoodie that I now traded away from the suits. So that a boy. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you're running alpha strategies. Are those uh, private LP type vehicles uh, that Bitwise has on the side and not alongside their ETFs, which I think most people probably know them for? Yeah, it's a good question, James. Our flagship vehicle is a multi-strategy solution in a private uh, fund format. But that being said, I do think the strategy for Bitwise is to offer active strategies in every investment wrapper possible. So you may have actually seen in the news recently that we are repurposing our futures-based ETF, BITC, as well as AE, into a trend-based strategy. So we're implementing a trend-following strategy, even within the ETF wrapper, that I think will bring nuanced sophistication and investor expression towards ways to invest in crypto. And of course, we manage also other custom mandates as to some investors coming and saying, hey, I'm seeing a ton of Bitcoin. I'd like to earn some yield on it. Can you help me find some yield? And we'll run different kinds of mandates of that nature also to help investors explore all the orthogonal alpha vectors in the space. Awesome. Yeah, we'll get, we'll definitely get into some of that more because we're going to talk a bit about Bitcoin ETF options and the stuff we could do with that. But Let's talk about like what I think is the biggest news of the last few days. Uh, there's two papers out. The ECB, the European Central Bank, put out a paper that basically said Bitcoin was fueling uh, the division of society. I, I mean, from my point of view, like I, re- I, I didn't read the whole thing. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to pretend like I read through the entire paper, but like I skimmed enough of it. And what I got from it was Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. It's worthless. But those who don't own it will be like impoverished <laughs> and like it's it's messing up side. I don't know. It's it was it was really bizarre to read. I, what did you guys skim it? How much did you read it? What what are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, same thing. Five minutes. It's uh, I thought it was a joke to be honest. <laughs> it, it's like if you think about it, this uh, the, the the gist of it was that if you if you uh, that if Bitcoin keeps on going up, it's basically generate division in society. That's it. And, uh, and, and if you think about it, the same thing applies to any asset that goes up. So you could say the exact same thing about stock indices. So yeah, of course, if, if you don't own stocks, uh, you're going to let behind quite likely. Uh, if you don't own Bitcoin or anything that, that appreciates, uh, you're going to be left behind. And there is a yeah, the vision of society between the haves and the haves nots. It's uh, just quite bizarre for the, for the ECB to put such a paper on, on such an obvious thing. This reminds me of Joe's comment about everything being the bimodal distribution here. It's like it's, you either own assets or you don't. And there's like two different worlds that people have been living in, if you've, depending on whether you've owned assets or not over the last decade plus. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, I, I, I can't believe, I mean, it's, it's kind of getting to the stage where like, you know, everyone's like, first they, they fight you and then they join you and all this stuff. They're definitely like, there's definitely like this instance of them trying to fight us. Joe, I don't know. What was your thoughts? 
I mean, full disclosure, I didn't read it because it looked like utter <laughs> nonsense from the the like commentary that I was just seeing. I was like, ah, oh, that's pretty on brand for the European Union to do something this stupid. I mean, maybe I'm, you know, stretching a bit here, but there has been a, I would say, a pretty concerted effort in Europe and the UK moving towards a more, I don't know, top-down centralized authority towards any sort of anything that could be not controlled by the state. You know, we saw what happened in the UK with people posting stuff on Facebook that were that was, you know, uncouth and ending up in jail. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty crazy. And it, it goes to show that I think if if this is actually the belief of the ECB or a member of the ECB, and this is being paraded through the rest of the members of the ECB and ultimately the European Union, is this just consistent with the broader view that like, hey, we need to actually clamp down on these decentralized approaches of, you know, uh, questioning our authority Maybe it's a stretch. I don't know. I will say that um, the person that wrote it, I believe, is an academic. And even though I think Nicholas Nassim Taleb is kind of an asshole on the internet, he's got a pretty powerful phrase for what he uses for people like this. He calls them intellectuals yet, yet idiots, IYIs. <laughs> and these are folks that have no skin in the game. And this isn't the case of all academics, but there's a number of folks in academia that will pontificate in the abstract and take these rather controversial positions, uh, but have absolutely no real skin in the game. I, I think Paul Krugman is like the, the epitome of this. And there's, there's myriad examples of this uh, historically. There's another guy on, on Twitter I saw yesterday. Uh, it was so good. He said something like... Um, Meme coins are a, a signal of like lower intelligence or something or low IQ. He's like a PhD Bitcoin nerd. I mean, it was just awesome. Like you can't help but see this kind of stuff and go, yeah, these guys just don't get it because they don't have any real skin in the game. And so to me, I just discount this stuff to zero. Could it potentially have been part of the reason we sold off on Monday? Maybe, but it just seems like complete nonsense. Joe, I'm going to augment your case there and actually argue that they do have skin in the game, but in the complete opposite direction, which is actually the issue with academia at times. One of the co-authors has actually architected the ECB since 1998, and that's his only career since. And so actually, he does have skin in the game. It's kind of skin in the game in the direction maybe you should not be publishing on a credibly neutral platform that academia is meant to proliferate upon. and so. This is, I think, at the crux why um, this is becoming problematic. I, if you read the paper, and I also glanced at it for only about five minutes, there's generally a well-known structure to how academic papers are written. You kind of have to argue for both sides and then zone in on your thesis and do make up some claims at the end for how you could be wrong. That's, that's the accepted way of how academics argue. This paper makes zero effort. And so one of my very good friends, uh, Professor Omid Malakan, who actually teaches at Columbia Business School, he ended up writing a rebuttal today and posted it on Twitter to explain why his friend uh, Ulrich might be wrong. And he actually spends a lot of time trying to explain why Bitcoin is not worthless and has this incredible utility in the ways people want it. But I almost want to tell Omid, Omid, you missed the point. Because that's not what this paper is arguing. This paper is arguing about what Alex had exactly mentioned, which is ultimately the redistribution of wealth is the problem. It, it doesn't actually talk about Bitcoin. It just talks about the fundamental asymmetry of market profits and losses and how that's bad for society. So you can't, you can't engage in a thoughtful debate when you're that far apart. And I think that's what we saw in the dangerous energy that is coming from which like, people pay attention to academia, right? There's ramifications that come out of this people then compound and snowball into these things and that's where it becomes really dangerous in my opinion actually, yeah that's a, a very point. good point a lot, a lot of these guys actually come from from academia we forget about it but uh fed fed bankers and ecb uh, um, officials many do come from academia they never had a a job in the private sector ever like ever pal pal does pal did <laughs> I, I will, and also before we even move on to the other report, I want to talk about another thing to note. I, don't, I think this happened since we last recorded. It definitely did. Italy, which I just went to Italy. I've been to Europe for the first time like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Italy is raising the cap gains tax on Bitcoin from twenty six percent to forty two percent. 
So, I mean, that's like just, just an example of something going on in Europe where that like that, I don't know, that would be insane to have happen in the U.S., but this Minneapolis Fed report is kind of like basically pitching that. So I'll, I'm just going to read like from the abstract, this one line that I think just summarizes everything. And in my head, it's like you're saying the quiet part out loud, but <laughs> it basically the Minneapolis Fed put out a report, I think it was today or yesterday, a legal prohibition against Bitcoin can restore unique implementation of permanent primary deficits. And so can a tax on Bitcoin at like a certain rate, a very high rate, essentially. So kind of like the cap gains we were talking about. He's basically saying like Bitcoin is making it obvious, I guess, that like we're running at like permanent deficits of the economy, saying the quiet part out loud. I don't know why that's different than gold in some regards, like to, in my mind, like I, they're signaling out um, Bitcoin. But also, I same thing. I skimmed this report for five minutes. It, there's a lot of uh, analogous language used here. A lot of it is, they, again, they call Bitcoin worthless. They say it's just pieces of paper. They say it's just, they're, they're substituting Bitcoin for something else. I'll get, I'll get the quote in a minute. But like... Pieces of paper? Bitcoin's <laughs> pieces got, of paper? I got huh. I got to get the actual pieces. quote. But yeah. That's a new one. I mean, I don't know. What, what were your guys' thoughts on this one? Same thing. Nonsense. I mean, it may be potentially politically motivated, arguably is politically motivated. This gets back to, I think, one of my hypotheses, uh, you know, a month or two ago, when I was talking about how it doesn't favor the Democrats to actually have a, a crypto stance, because then they can use the fact that cr Trump is pro crypto to, to continue to divide the nation or or the electorate. And I saw this thing the other day, which I kind of agree with, that Kamala Harris's strategy right now is not Trump, right? Like she, they don't have to list literally any policies. All they have to do is say like, we're not that guy which is like a pretty effective strategy if you can convince, you know, 51% of people or 52% of people that you shouldn't have that guy as your president. So does that imply that the folks that wrote this paper are, you know, pro Kamala Harris? It almost feels like it is, um, I don't want to say anti-Trump, but just the, the language used in this paper feels like it's uh, creating that further division and trying to justify it through academic means, which just seems ridiculous again. Yeah, I'm also reminded maybe, was it last week that one of the Fed governors, uh, I believe it was Waller, who came out in support of DeFi potentially as a substitute for ways that it could uh, replace some of our centralized finance services. And I wonder actually if that was maybe a little bit of a rebuttal energy that came out to, to, to kind of oppose one other uh, Fed governor uh, in the context of the political um, fabric we're living amidst. Yeah, I, I got. I found the quote that I was looking for. They, 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 we use Bitcoin as a metaphor for private sector security that is in fixed supply and that is not a claim to any real resources. And then there's like a whole section about like what to do when Bitcoin is illegal. And it all really comes back to the fact that they want to make sure that government debt remains the only risk-free security so people won't realize that they're being like <laughs> inflated away, I guess, and redistributed. Um, it's, it's, it, it's literally saying the quiet part out loud, which was, um, a little bizarre to me. Let me take it a little bit further there because I thought it was very interesting. This one, I mean, ridiculous, but, but interesting. It's the, the TLDR was Bitcoin is a useless asset. And even though its price converges to zero, second statement, it's very presence makes it harder for the government to control its deficit and debt. Basically, making it harder for the government to run permanent primary deficits, potentially forcing the government to balance its budget. Solution: prohibit or tax Bitcoin. I, I Absolute just, insanity. I, I don't understand. How is that any different from like gold or like other precious metals, silver? It's like not that different. Of I don't know, whatever. That's why I put my tinfoil hat on and go, man, this has got to be some political Well, going back motivation. to the political motivations, I mean, let, let's talk about the election right now. Um, Trump is leading in pretty much all the major polls that I've been able to see. Uh, do we think, like, I mean, my theory is it's pro that's probably some of the reason why we've seen a run up in prices, primarily with Bitcoin. Uh, I think there's a, there's a bit of pricing correlation there between Trump's polling odds and the price of crypto. I mean, what are, what are your guys' thoughts there? I mean... Last Monday, when when you know Bitcoin kind of ripped out of the gate at the New York Open, I was skeptical at first because my trading partner was like, "Feels like you know the the Trump bump or Trump's odds improving or imp are bleeding over into the price of Bitcoin." But 
we just had massive ETF inflows last week. And it's been the same story like all year when, when there's big flows that come in. And I mean, I'm sure Jeff, uh, given his, his connection to the folks at Bitwise are probably aware of this. Like when there's big flows that come in, price goes up. When it flows come out, price goes down. And yes, there's basis trades that end up impacting this to some extent. But last week we had, you know, I think that the highest weekly inflows since like March or something. Is that because of Trump? I don't know. I think people love to find correlations to, to create the causal connection. I think there's probably some of it. But, you know, I don't know, Jeff, maybe you can illuminate a, us a little bit on like the maybe the retail versus institutional demand for these products because I've heard both sides. I've heard that there's a lot of institutions that are actually buying these ETFs and then I hear like oh it's all these you know folks on Robinhood. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I would agree first of all that flows determine everything, uh, especially for Bitcoin. And it's not an accident that perhaps the highest flows you've seen in a long time with these ETFs coincided with I think the new historic high for CME open interests as well. There, Joe, as you mentioned, there can be some trading that's relative value oriented going on there, but it shows you that still there's money coming into the system. And generally when money comes in, it stays around in some fashion. One example of this is I recently heard from a friend who um, was in the hedge fund industry, a fairly senior guy, ex Morgan Stanley. He told me that one of the ways that pensions are thinking about allocating crypto is they actually have uh, consultants pitch with BlackRock a model portfolio where it comes out of the fixed income bucket that you make a small allocation to Bitcoin. <clears throat> so you make it into a multi-asset custom portfolio pitch. And within the fixed income segment, you just put in a little bit of Bitcoin. And this makes everything look better. Of course, you all know that. But it also, I think, opens the eyes for people to talk about exactly the kind of hedging that we're all alluding to here, which is how to think about uh, our fiscal deficit. So these kinds of conversations are happening. This is like a Taft-Harley plan, right? They're the most conservative kinds of American investors you'll ever find. And so I think not just retail, but there's a channel of institutional capital that is finding a way to harness this energy, even though you don't see it wide open in the press. And I can tell you from all the dialogues I'm having on behalf of Bitwise with these kinds of institutional investors, they are all paying attention. Whether, again, it's as Joe, you alluded to it, whether it's correlation or causation, whether the election is driving it, there's no mistake that people are paying attention. And I think that's generally a good thing that drives flows. See, look, that's why he's the head of Alpha Strategies, guys. Right yeah, there. I mean, ju just to put some numbers on there, the, the U.S. spot Bitcoin ETFs, Joe talked about the big week. There, it was over $2.1 billion that came in last week. So, like, it, it's funny. I, I remember when, like, they had, like, a billion dollars that came out in a week and every, there were people jumping on the grave of the ETFs, like... Like this is going to be the, like, this is the downfall for them. And I'm like, I say this, I've said this in many episodes here. You're going to see outflow weeks as the trend is going up. We're about $21 billion in inflow since these things launched on January 11th, which is just, I mean, if you told anyone in, in January that these things are going to take in $21 billion on a net basis in aggregate back in January within the first seven months or whatever, nine months it is. Everyone would have said that's unbelievable. We're going to be at all time highs. We're going to hit one hundred thousand dollars Bitcoin. I think at least that's what I would have guessed. Essentially, James, do you, do you have? Can you pull up or do you recall? Like, you know, I think obviously Bloomberg. You guys had an estimate for uh, uh, inflows for twenty twenty four. I think Bitwise and like the other issuers had them. I'm just curious, like how accurate we're tracking towards. Those given that we're at 21 billion and there's still like two months. I mean, to go. Our, our number was, I think our number was 15 billion by the end of 2024. So <laughs> we're done already. Um, and but I, I will say, we, I also, we <laughs> were, I said that they, uh, we thought that Ethereum ETFs would do like 15 to maybe 25%. I settle around that 15 to 20% range mostly. Uh, we're, we're still negative on those. So we, we over, we undershot in Bitcoin yep. and we overshot in Ethereum, but we're not done. We're not through the end of the year yet. Question for you guys, James, uh, Jeff, what, what percentage you reckon of, of inflows that are, um, uh, directional, basically, uh, net inflows, no arving basis, no arving futures, just, just pure inflows. It's a good question. We don't have a uh, look through attribution to that level, but based on the filings of the prior 13 Fs, I would imagine that a good chunk still is driven by relative value traders. And especially with 
the futures basis spread annualizing over 10%, I do think that is inevitably a big component, right? To me, that 10% is kind of important because it clears what hedge fund return hurdles can be for people to then take interest. And it's actually quite low. The hurdle is probably like 7%. So if it's above seven, people are interested. If it's below seven, it's not. So you know, it's not about whether it's 10 and 25. It's If it's over seven, it gets interesting. So I do think there's a lot of that demand that has been pushed in there. But nonetheless, uh, the, the, the conversations that we're seeing with all our advisors makes me think that I would like to be pleasantly surprised in the other direction come next 13 Fs, that there are people accumulating slowly here, um, even at the institutional yeah, caliber. I mean, let's be clear here. I mean, like I said, $2.1 billion came in last week. There's no way that's all retail. I mean, that's, that's an insane amount of money. Um, and also, um, I, I actually debated Jim Bianco on stage about the success of the ETFs. And one of the things we talked about is like, yes, uh, investment advisors have somewhere, I, I would think the number is around $2.5 billion based on the last... Um, 13 F filing to around two ish over two. Um, all right. That's a small fraction of the 60 ish billion dollars that are in these things now overall, but that's still like for an ETF that just launched this year to get that much RAA money, investor, uh, advisor assets is a smashing success. And I'm expecting that number is going to go way up when we see the data from September 30th, which we'll get in, uh, around, November 15th. So right after the election, we'll get a better understanding of like where, who else bought some of these things. But as Jeff said, a lot of it is hedge funds right now. They have, there's multiple hedge funds with hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and it's that basis trade that he was talking about. Yeah. I mean, if we think about the Trump trade though, I'd love to get Alex's perspective on this. Like, what do you think the Trump trade is right now, Alex? Like I, we, me and some folks at asymmetric have debated this internally and our view really is, uh, you know, if if Trump wins the election, Bitcoin going to 100K could happen very quickly, like shockingly quickly. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's some of the current market structure and dynamics that exists, uh, particularly around the end of December open interest for uh, options is 100K. Uh, there's a lot of gamma right now at 70K. There's, it's been that way all year long. But another point that I, I found out over the weekend is that exchange balances, centralized exchange balances of Bitcoin are at five-year lows. So, you know, on the one hand, if the folks that were overriding calls to, to you know, clip some carry by, by selling premium get called away, they're not going to have any Bitcoin left and they're going to have to buy it back. Well, there's not a lot of Bitcoin on exchanges, at least according to, you know, on-chain metrics and, and the exchange metrics. So what do you think, Alex? What happens in a Trump Wait, victory? real quick, Joe. Can you define gamma for us uh, idiots who don't understand Greek alphabets when it comes to options? Yeah, it's like the acceleration of the delta of the option, right? So it's like the second derivative, if you will. And the like, it gets... It gets wild around a certain strike where there's a heavy amount of, of short gamma. This is the, the GameStop trade. So if you guys remember what happened with GameStop, um, the options market was basically driving the price of the stock. And then the stock was ultimately then driving the price of options. But ultimately, these folks that kept selling calls to take in premium because you know the, the thing had risen so much, well, the stock kept going higher. And then it created, forced them to actually buy the stock back to cover them being short those calls. Because if you're selling a call at a certain strike price, if the price goes through it, you have to deliver the stock, right? Well, if the stock price is ripping, then you got to chase it higher. So gamma squeezes can be extremely violent, like we saw with GameStop. Thus far this year with crypto, uh, specifically Bitcoin, around the 70K strike, there's been a ton of gamma. And folks have been selling calls to collect premium, to clip some additional carry. At some point, if we do, in fact, break out, which I'm confident we will, that thing's going to get run over. And those folks are going to have to buy back Bitcoin. Yeah, that's why uh, it, it's a way to think about it, this, this uh, principle of the, the, the longer the consolidation, the stronger the breakout. Because people yep. are basically, they, they've been either shorting or uh, hedging or uh, selling calls for say six months. Yep. And uh, those guys, they basically have to, they, they either get run over and they have to unwind their positions. So uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it looks looks pretty good. But but uh, going back to the Trump uh, trade, uh, I think the way to think about it is uh, you have uh, like like the, the, each uh, candidate. It's uh, there's like four verticals. One is uh, one is spending. The other one is regulations. The other one is immigration. The other one is um, tariffs. When it comes to to spending, uh, the market and I, I think it's the same way. By the way, it's not. This is consensus. Uh, the market sees Trump as more aggressive on the spending side, is going to spend more and is going to lower taxes. So that would drive, uh, Republicans would drive higher budget deficits, which basically would lead to lower interest rates and a steepening of the yield curve uh, based on the expectation of basically much, much uh, uh, higher rates down the line. So, so again, uh, it's a higher rates, uh, lower bond prices, not lower yields, and uh, a ste- steepening of the curve. A steepening of the curve is good for financials, which is banks basically mainly, and uh, lower regulation is also good for financials. Uh, that being said, the main trade is Bitcoin and is is uh, is altcoins. I think that's that's the main uh, uh, Trump trade, and and we've been talking on, in in the pot here for for quite a few months. Uh, I prefer ETH and Sol over Bitcoin on a on a Trump win than than Bitcoin itself. Sorry, Maxis, it's just common sense to me. I think obviously if Trump does half the things that he seems to think he's going to do with the SEC and this other stuff, his a win for him is way more impactful for all coins than it is for Bitcoin. I feel like Bitcoin is like kind of like set as far as I'm concerned. Even even the SEC is calling it a commodity. There's a lot of things that are still up in the air for every other altcoin, essentially, even somewhat related to Ethereum. So I I fully agree with you on that, Alex. But Jeff Jeff is the head of Alpha Strategy. So give us some alpha here. What what are your thinking? What is your thinking here on the election? <laughs> you guys are putting me on the spot. Well. I've been crunching with it. I'd be super curious for all of you guys' take on it. So I'm a little bit of a student of merger arbitrage and how to kind of think about distribution probabilities based on price movements. And I've been looking at the poly market data to see if there's a delta we could assign to the highs and lows of what Bitcoin might be based on that event. Uh, And so what I've done specifically is I looked at the summer in August and September when Kamala's odds were higher than Trump's and how much the spread worked in our favor with Bitcoin's price reflecting that. And then vice versa, more recently with Trump gaining an edge, try to compile it and draw a regression out of it to see what the uh, market might be saying a Trump win would lead to XYZ Bitcoin price or, or vice versa. And the number that I have found to be best retrofitted is that if Trump wins, the probability assignment would imply that Bitcoin could go to $92,000. And if Trump loses, Bitcoin might go to 37,000. So again, these are pretty unscientific range bound numbers that I'm trying to just retrofit based on the most amount of data uh, that I can find. But I think that alone tells you, like, regardless of the setup that Joe just described on the gamma squeeze and all the other things that's going to work in the favor of, of, of where we're going to go, it, it feels to me that already like the the probabilities are, pr- are pretty fair in in how bitcoin will inevitably find that price if trump wins uh, i i want to say I, I think this is very important it, it's on a on a on a harris win i mean 37k is, is pretty extreme right that's yeah, quite a drop we, <laughs> that's not cool <laughs> That's uh, we, we need to that's catch. not that's cool. like that's very not, very scientific uh, there alex so, yeah it's not just like yeah so, but I, I don't think, I mean, this is very subjective and this is where actually what, what makes a market a market, right? I, I think on a, on a Harris win, uh, we go down a little bit and then we continue going up driven by macro because right. I, I think actually it's macro and the adoption story is more important than actually Trump versus Harris. Uh, it matters a lot, but it's secondary for Bitcoin, not for altcoins. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of agree with Alex on this. Like, from a trader's perspective, what we would love to see is new all-time highs in Bitcoin because sentiment is that Trump is going to win. So we plow through that belly of the gamma and maybe get to 80K or something to that effect. And then in this scenario, if Harris actually wins, you better believe the momentum ignition algorithms that are market abuse algorithms will push Bitcoin lower just on the headline alone. 
But then to Alex's point, the macro just points to Bitcoin going higher because both candidates are going to increase the deficit. The odds that Trump does that in a more material way than Harris are pretty stacked in his favor, which is why I think you see you know, things like the long bond selling off with this belief that Trump is actually going to win. You also see, uh, I think last week, Goldman Sachs prime book was showcasing that um, they're like the Democratic Democrat winner stocks and these Republican winner stocks, um, whatever they qualify that as in their basket. People were dumping, meaning likely hedge funds, were dumping Democratic winners and buying Republican winners. Uh, you saw the long bond uh, sell off, which is higher, you know, implies higher deficits, et cetera. So best case scenario, I think, is we actually get to new all-time highs ahead of the election. That would be amazing because then we've already kind of chewed through a lot of the market structure that's potentially kind of holding Bitcoin back and the market more broadly, such that if there is a Harris win, expect some type of a you know a pullback or reaction just based on the the algorithms that are going to be trading it gemini is a crypto exchange with tools for all traders cameron and tyler winklevoss founded gemini in 2014 and have been pioneers for the crypto industry for over a decade fun fact they submitted the first spot bitcoin etf application and were one of the first exchanges to receive a trust license in new york Gemini operates with a security first mentality, from being a licensed full reserve exchange and custodian to offering leading security features like pass keys, Gemini continues to set the bar for compliance and innovation. Head over to Gemini.com slash Unchained and start trading to earn $15 in Bitcoin. The Stellar Network is built to power real world solutions that will onboard the next billion people. Build a future proof dApp underpinned by more secure Rust smart contracts transactions confirmed in seconds, and a predictable fee structure that scales. Find product market fit with one of the fastest growing DeFi ecosystems and a user base of millions in emerging markets worldwide. Deliver real world utility on a network with more than 16 billion network operations. Build better, build on Stellar. Head to Stellar.org to learn more. Yeah, I have, I have, I'm sharing on my screen right now one, one of my favorite things over the last couple of weeks that they built on the terminal and the top, it's showing like the RCP polling average. So like what the polls are saying, think like Nate Silver type stuff. And right now the polls are still saying that Kamala's, uh, Harris is ahead 49.2 to Trump's uh, 48.3. But then you look at poly market. I mean, I've been saying this pretty much every time we record an episode, I felt like poly market was definitely tilted in favor of Trump and we need to like knock off some of that spread. And I think there was a bunch of, there's been a bunch of reporting done over the last week or two, basically saying there's a bunch of huge whales, like meaningfully moving those markets. So it's not as, uh, it's not as efficient a market as we thought, but also Kalshi is up there and that's not, I wouldn't consider that to be uh, as, you know, right leaning due to it not being specifically crypto, but they have, that has Trump at 58 and, and Harris at 43. So I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on like the differences between these betting markets and what the polling markets are? And I also have, this is another one that's new. Kalshi just got approved uh, like legally <laughs> in the court. So you can see on a court, on a, on a map basis where things are going right now. And yeah, it doesn't look good for the Democrats if you're just trusting uh, betting markets. You want to, uh, Joe, you, I know you have thoughts on this. So I guess <laughs> let's go with you first. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I, I've been uh, <laughs> I've been saying this for months now on, on our pod, which is like I think it's a coin flip. Um, if we look into things like poly market, there's been a lot of uh, opining on whether or not there's an individual whale pushing these markets up, or if it's there's an arbitrage opportunity between predicted and poly market. I even saw some nonsense about somebody saying there's market manipulation on poly market, and I'm like. The only people in crypto that complain about market manipulation are just <laughs> shitty traders because you can't have market manipulation on a permissionless network. It's literally what the market is doing. So if somebody or some wallet or some entity or some AI agent is actually bidding up Trump on poly market, that's not market manipulation. That's, that's called a trade. Market. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah. so like, there are folks that are professional, you know, call them like prediction market gamblers, if you will, or quasi, you know, poker players, et cetera, that do this stuff for a living. And 
I don't think that the ARB opportunity is big enough uh, to justify trying to ARB between something like predict it, where you can't really bet reasonable size, and what you can do on poly market. So I don't think uh, I, I just look at what the market says. And if the market says, hey, you know, poly market has Trump way ahead, but the polls are polling this way. Well, which one has getting back to the skin of the game concept? Which one has skin in the game? Somebody who is being polled on a phone call or in person or someone that's putting their money to, to risk. And in my opinion, it's people that are putting their money to risk. Now, again, if it's just some whale that's pushing the market up, the other side. well, that's what the market's saying, right? So they're either going to be really wrong or they're going to make a lot of money and be really right. The other thing I would say in my mind is like, theoretically, if you're like all in on crypto and you're worried that Harris is going to ruin things, like you'd probably want to make some money in the event that like you want to hedge your risks, I guess. So theoretically, I, I would think that Harris would be going up, but this is just people out and out betting on Trump. Yeah, actually, in, in fact, when when uh, when I think it was, man, I could be wrong. Maybe it was like sixty one thirty nine or something. Trump to to Harris. I was like, honestly, buying <laughs> yes, Harris right? at this price is like Value. really good. Like that that would have been a great hedge, you know, in the case that uh, that that she actually wins, right? Like, and then you are subsequently sad because crypto will continue to be kind of dribbling along through through U.S. Uh, policy and regulations. I mean, the other alternative, of course, is just to buy a Kamala Harris meme <laughs> point. Je- Jeff, do you, you have any thoughts here? You know, I don't think I have anything super nuanced to add beyond the fact that I think um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big student of just recognizing that markets are fairly efficient at what they do. Uh, I don't know if you guys read On the Edge by Nate Silver I did. recently. That came I'm in the out middle of reading months. it on my list. Yeah, I think it's such a wonderful book because it talks about risk taking in a way that normalizes it so that it's not this like weird like gambling poker like phenomenon. And 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 in that sense, um, I think what people are getting mixed up here is like they do see like weird things happening in poly market where like the ticks look a little strange, like relative to other things, and and they find that to be like unwholesome, right? This idea that you're financializing something as important as an election feels like it's an unwholesome endeavor. I think there's a little bit of this like mental incongruence that is occurring at the larger societal debate as to whether these things are good or bad. And then, you know, you just have to remember like many, many, many things in life are just financialized, whether you see it or not upfront or not, even like Garja Art, for example, someone might be trading that spread and hedging it with a sector ETF and things happen. And so, you know, I hate to break it to people, but like, if people are making bets on outcomes and it's be, it's with money, it's probably a better signal than those making decisions without money. Like, I, I think it's maybe just even that fundamental at some level. And people should want more skin in the game, if not just to get better information. And that's at a high level what I think of this particular debate that I see on both sides. I, I, I so agree with what you're saying, Jeff. And actually, when we were in Jackson Hole, you you recommended that book and it's, it's on my list. Um, this is, you know, one of the things that young traders or new traders will always ask me about, like, how to trade or, you know, how, how are you figuring out all this information or whatever? And I'm like, well, I just, I put money to, to work. Like, I, I test the order books. I see how it reacts to a small bid or a big bid or a market order or a limit order. And like, that's how you actually get a lot of this intelligence. So I completely agree that by putting your money at risk, you actually learn more because you've got actual skin in the game. You, you could suffer from loss aversion. From doing something like that. So I wholeheartedly agree that this is why I don't believe that there's this nonsense around market manipulation with poly market. There's just people actually betting one direction that is not consistent with, you know, polls, which pick the poll that you want to to fit your narrative and you'll probably find your answer, right? You know, something else there I want to add is almost every single Trump trade is moving in the same direction. If you pick the, uh, let, let's, let, so we have polls, we can argue about who's ahead, who's behind, uh, bias on the polls, but the trend in the polls is, is very uniform. It's in favor of Trump. That is in line with poly market going up for Trump. I agree that actually Trump right now is, is uh, it's a little bit too much. Um, the other thing is uh, you can look at the, the uh, DJT stock 
to going up. It's up like 100% in, in, a, in a few weeks. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, uh, as, as we were talking about before, one of the Trump trades is higher yields, especially long, long bonds. So long, long bonds down, long rates up. And, uh, and that is the most liquid market in the world, the 10 year bond. And it's actually, it's, it's, you can see it in the last few weeks, just in line with crypto and all the Trump trades, the direction is extremely clear and the trend has been very pronounced. And, and that being said, I want to, want to share actually, I, I, I've been saying here, uh, for months that I thought the, uh, the election is, uh, coin toss. And I changed my view, actually. I think it's going for Trump. And uh, I'm saying this because uh, I've been uh, digging a lot into bias in the polls in the last uh, elections, 16, 20, and the midterms, 18 and 22. And the bias when Trump is running is very significant. It's like 5 to 7% in favor of, uh, against Trump. So the question there is, have pollsters managed to get rid of this anti-Trump bias or not? And I, I don't think so. You were talking what about- What do you long, guys think? You, you, I actually, I, I'm, I'm now, I think it's, I think the polls are inaccurate based on everything else that I'm seeing. And like, if you look at some of the more local polls, it kind of implies that the, it should, should be leaning a little bit more Trump, but who knows? I was actually in Philly this weekend and I was driving on 95 for anyone who knows the area and the whole road shut down. I'm like 90% sure that the Trump's, uh, uh, I don't even know, parade of cars was was blocking and stopped the whole highways and created so much traffic for me. So I'm not happy with him right now. But the, you were talking mm -hmm. about long bonds. Dr Stanley Druckenmiller <laughs> today, big news came out. He is so he's a le absolutely legendary investor, and he has a massive short position against. The, he's betting against the Fed. He's he's short the Fed with 20 percent of his portfolio right now. Well, at least the, the portfolio that we can see. So we don't know what what else is involved here. So I will take a step back and say we can only see certain things here. But he's 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 betting against uh, betting against the Fed here. Yeah, B ballsy move, but also Druck is known for just completely changing his view overnight. So right. for all you know, he could have covered yeah, that. He's, by now. <laughs> he's on the opposite yep. side now. But before we move on, I actually wanted to share this, which I thought was an awesome chart from Alex Thorne over at Galaxy Digital, talking about the fact that like yeah, we could go to all time highs, but if you like adjust this for inflation, like we are kind of nowhere near the the well, not nowhere near, but. We're, 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 it's at least 12, you got to subtract somewhere around $12,000 likely in the Bitcoin price to get a more accurate uh, price compared to what the, the prior all time highs were. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts or interest in that, but I thought that was worth sharing because I found it, it's something we've kind of talked about, but never really blatantly showed it. Yeah, it's, it's a great chart by Alex. He does great, great work over at Galaxy. I don't think anybody pays attention to inflation adjusted anything, <laughs> to be totally honest, but it, it it makes for really good Twitter engagement. So also, also, Alex. also FX adjusts, right? It's like we're so yeah, lucky US American because living a dollar denied. But the reality is Bitcoin has surpassed all time highs in many other local currencies. That's right. I can tell you people pay attention to that in the ways that we don't have to worry about. So it just shows you, yeah, inflation's a part that many of us should actually adjust to it. I'm a big fan of Alex also. I'm glad he's bringing that more to the public domain. Yeah, he's he's he does very good research. Let's uh, mm -hmm. let's move on real quick to rates. I mean, we talk about rates every week, but there has been a change since we last recorded. Um, this is showing the interest rate uh, probability of like what's going to happen for the rest of the year. If you listened last week, you know that we were basically pricing for a 25 basis point cut in November and then another 25 basis point cut in uh, December. And now the market's basically pricing for the fact that we might only get one more cut this year. Um, I don't know. Joe, you have a you're, you're you're the interest rate guy that talks about it the most. You've had your strongest views. What what are your thoughts here? It's going to take another week or two for the the cuts to come back into the market and get priced. I mean, <clears throat> there's some other actual market related things that are happening behind the scenes that are affecting this. Yes, there's been strong retail sales and a couple of other data points that have come out, but there's just the, the idea that the Fed isn't going to cut. Uh, is only going to cut one more time this year. It just seems like utter fan, utter fantasy to me. And uh, you know, last week we had um, Waller coming out and basically saying the same type of stuff that like we can we can uh, you know adjust or move our or pull pull hikes forward or pull cuts forward. Excuse me. Um, 
kind of beating the same drum before they did 50 bips. And like, I don't think, you know, as we see here today, based on the data that I have, I think it would be a stretch for them to actually do 50. It's still, it's still a possibility, of course, but to me, it just still feels like they're, they're loaded up for 25 basis cut points until they get from, from my perspective down to like 3% to three and a quarter, somewhere in that range. Yeah. I'll go on record and say, I think we get a 25 and 25. That's my, that would be my guess, but what do I know? Alex thoughts. Yeah. Same thing. We have very good data especially payrolls uh, on, on the first Friday of the month. Like, like they, they came at, uh, I think it was 250K. Uh, so literally changing the, the, down, the downtrend on payrolls that we've been seeing. So uh, basically throughout the uh, hard landing uh, narrative uh, uh, out the window, at least temporarily, uh, now yep. casts are, are saying 3% GDP uh, for Q3. I think things are looking good. I think 25-25 makes sense. The, the Fed is going to try to to stay on course. They've been very repetitive in the last uh, month or last few weeks on on uh, the fact that the rates right now are tight. Basically, they're restrictive. Uh, they're right. basically talking about three to three and a half percent. Nobody knows, and they say repeatedly they don't know where the neutral rate is, but they seem to think more more of most of them that is between three and three and a half percent. So we are very tight right now, and they, they're more concerned now about the job market than inflation. Inflation, unless you, we have an insane print, inflation doesn't matter. If you're a trader, stop, stop waking up. You know, if you're in, living in Hawaii, stop waking up at 8.30 <laughs> or 8.15 in the morning, uh, you know, Eastern time to trade uh, uh, CPI because you're... Yeah, yeah. right here. It's pricing <laughs> three point. Four percent, roughly, by the January 2025 meeting. So a year and change out from now is basically what Alex is talking about. Jeff, you have any any thoughts here on rates before we move on? No, you know, I agree with everyone here. The one maybe view that I would share is that sometimes I think that the way the Fed governors and the mainstream media talks about at large about this particular decision being driven by factors that sometimes I genuinely wonder if there's a broader conspiracy theory behind the scenes where none of this is truly <laughs> relevant. I think about that. Often, like there's so many pundits looking at like non-farm payroll data and unemployment and try to, you know, assume the Fed is acting upon a certain mission. But then, like, I think we all know we live in a world where it's not clear if the market's driving the economy or if the economy is driving the market. And when you think about that, there are certain conditions that I think we all are observing that looks highly unnatural. I, I mean, we were just talking about it, Joe, like the move index is at 125. Yeah, that's a pretty high level. And if you've been following the wait, wait, reverse wait, repo, Explain what the move index um, is. There's definitely a whole bunch of people here that have no idea what that is. Sure. The most commonly cited vol index, of course, is the VIX, which is on the equities market and the volatility that's demonstrated. But the move index actually represents the same feature, but for bonds, uh, treasuries. And the reason it's really important is because while it's not a headline number that communicates like a fear gauge, it's the most important metric that determines the capital ratio that banks would likely lend against based on the fact that they're the largest assets that are sitting on their balance sheet. So in other words, if the move index is high and fixed income ball is high, well, the haircut's going to be a lot more onerous for those people to then create leverage on top of it. So it actually is a part of the financial plumbing. And that actually sometimes matters a little bit more than the actual price action of the stock market. And you combine that with also the reverse repo operations, which has now, I think, almost gotten back to the lows we saw in September before the rate cut. It's like 240, 50 billion or so. Like you see like liquidity uh, draining in a way where like it, it's a it's, it's kind of a problem like outside of unemployment stuff and inflation stuff and all those things. And so. I, I agree with you guys that I think there's going to be more aggressive cuts still, if not just because this is a problem. Like if, even if people aren't talking about this is actually going to destroy things. And so that's that's also something that I want to share with you guys on the same side. Yeah. I mean, Je Jeff brings up a, a great point. Like I've had these <laughs> debates with <laughs> some folks that are saying, the economy is doing so well. They don't need to cut rates. It's not restrictive. I'm like, um, if you're a car dealership. I don't know. Have you seen <laughs> their ball court? Yeah. <laughs> like, have you seen the volatility in the repo markets? Like that stuff's not supposed to happen. And if you drain RRP down to zero, 
there's a liquidity issue. If the Fed is going to keep, you know, rolling assets off its balance sheet, that's even more liquidity issues. Like this is a function of liquidity at some point. And that's why I'm still very confident that the Fed is going to continue to cut these rates because they've got to pr- apply or su- provide the, the kind of lubrication for the asset, uh, the, the, the financial markets. Like there's just no other way around it. And do you want to have, uh, you know, a, a shock in the money markets? No, you absolutely don't want to have that happen, irrespective of what's happening with CPI, PCE, non-farm payrolls, et cetera. So Jeff brings up a great point. Like this liquidity picture has to improve or the Fed is going to have a serious issue. Yeah. And there's all, there's obviously plenty of sectors that are struggling really hard with these high rates, cars, uh, mortgage lenders, you, you name it. Anybody, anybody in the mortgage industry is having a real hard time. So they're praying that these these cuts actually come in the way that they're supposed to. Or even businesses that rely on credit to run their business, like the Russell 2000s, right? Like we talked about this before. One of the biggest beneficiaries to rate cuts are businesses that are, you know, call them small caps, if you will, that are having to borrow at very high rates. Well, that starts to come down. It can put some, take some pressure off of the companies to Mm -hmm. service their debt. That's net positive for the broader economy. So I just don't buy this. And it was, clearly proven to be true that this notion that somehow um, rate cuts are going to crash the economy. We only cut 50 bips whenever there's a problem. Like, you know, what happened after that? It's like, look what happened since then, right? We've gone basically straight up to new all-time highs, I think for S&P 500 and Dow, NASDAQ close, Russell close, right? Bitcoin close. So it's just, I don't know. I I get like kind of hung up on this idea that people are so backwards looking and saying, Look at these cherry picked data points of when they did this and the economy crashed after that. It's like this time is different. Yeah, it's funny. You brought up the Russell 2000. I'm actually do I believe it or not, I do research on things other than crypto. And I'm writing a lot of research about uh, the active small cap space. Uh, so there's uh, full 500 billion ish dollars in assets and actively managed small cap funds. Overwhelmingly so small cap managers. They have like a massive overweight to large cap and a massive overweight to mid cap. So the Russell 2000 actually is, there's a lot of mid cap stocks in there, but even still active managers in yeah. general, like across the board, whether you're looking at value, growth, no matter how you slice it, every active manager is like tilt and heavy towards large caps, which usually like when you're a large cap manager, you think like they're juicing their returns with small cap stocks and things like that. It's the exact opposite happening in this environment. It makes sense when you think about the tech environment and everything that's going on, but yeah, I thought that was just, that was interesting uh, to point out. Let's move on to Bitcoin ETF options. I've been I, we've talked about it every week. My stance really hasn't changed. Um, I think it, I I, w- I won't say this year's off the table. My my view is I think Q1. That's what I said that on stage in Salt Lake. I think Q1 is likely when it's going to happen. The problem is we just don't have a deadline. I think based on the, there was a, we talked about this last time, a whole bunch of language change in these defilings, basically talking about position limits. I think the SEC was essentially worried about what Joe was talking about before. They don't want somebody to be able to use like a gamma squeeze and Bitcoin ETF options to like affect the underlying market price. That's what the CFTC is concerned about. They don't want the underlying spot market to be manipulated. It makes sense. There's a bunch of position limits now in the approval orders from the SEC. I'm assuming like that's mostly cut and dry. So I don't know what else is waiting on. So basically the CFTC basically needs to give the green light for the options clearing corporation to let these things start trading. My guess at this point, I've talked to a few people, particularly in Spring Lake, uh, Spring Lake in Salt Lake. I think there's like, just like they're worried about like second order effects. So I talked last time, uh, there, there's like platinum and palladium ETFs that have been trying to get options on their ETFs under the same process for a decade. There's a whole bunch of gold ETFs that have launched that like just don't have options. They haven't been able to get approved under the same process. So like also, so one, the SEC and CFTC have gone down this path of like selectively choosing funds in this process to get options. So one, are they going to approve all 11 Bitcoin ETFs to get options? And two, if I'm one of those issuers that holds one of those platinum and palladium ETFs that have had this sitting on the CFT's desk for over a decade trying to get approved or any other ETF, like what are they going to do? Go back and just green light all of these? I like. I, I'd be annoyed. So I think there's, I'm guessing my, this is just a hunch. I think there's something along those lines that is going to possibly kick this can down the road. But I think BlackRock, Nicey, Fidelity, all these huge behemoths out there, CBOE, they'll figure out a way to get it through the finish line. So my guess is Q1. Now, Jeff, obviously 
his firm has BitB, one of the largest Bitcoin ETFs in the U.S. They're trying to get options. What what's what's your view on this? Yeah, that's great coverage, James. I largely agree with you. I think it will likely be sometime early next year. And part of that is because to the way you've mentioned, we're seeing real movement on actually productive dialogues happening, right? So actually, you might have noticed not every issuer got approved, by the way, on this. So I don't want to who didn't, but but there were some that did not uh, find its way through with NICE. And that shows you already there's enough deliberation happening behind the scenes. Otherwise, they would have just done blanket things if the whole point is to not make any of these things happen. Same thing you said about position limits. The fact that these things are like being firmed up means there's real intention. And so I think that the CFTC will likely find its way post to give the OCC approval. There's always been a little part of me in the back of my head wondering um, for reasons they too want to exert dominance in the futures and options market that they might actually play a role in holding back. And I think what I'm just really thankful about the CFTC as an organization that just is fundamentally different than the SEC is that they know that as a regulator, that they are the hub of these innovative products. And I think maybe at some point, there is a little bit of that cultural difference in which they're willing to compete for merit. So what I mean by this is you might have also seen the Bitcoin Friday futures launch a few weeks back. I mean, if you think about that, that is highly unlike the CME, right? The CME does not cater to retail investors calling their products BFFs uh, <laughs> at, at, a, at, a, at a shrimp size uh, that you would trade, less than a shrimp size uh, actually by, by Bitcoiners. And so... You know, I think the CME also is saying, you know what, we'll compete for retail uh, and we're going to do it in actually a pretty fair way. And I think that's part of the energy we're seeing here, which, which, which I just love. Like, I just think an open, fair market with these things kind of being not in the way is, is the way to go. And so I'm pretty bullish that, yeah, as you said, James, we'll see something move early next year. Yeah, I would say once these things get approved, look out for a ton of different ETF products I'll talk about on here as they get filed. But we've already seen a bunch of these these uh, defined outcome products. Basically, once you have options, you can do things where you're like, I want to get uh, up to a certain amount of the upside. So maybe you can capture if Bitcoin moves 20% a year, you'll get all of that. But if it goes to 50%, you're only going to get 20%. You get downside cap protection. So you're not going to get de- exposed to the full loss. And all of a sudden, you're going to get people that you know, in my view, the volatility of Bitcoin is like a positive thing, particularly for a portfolio, especially if you're rebalancing potentially. Uh, but there's plenty of people that like the volatility of Bitcoin is why they aren't investing. And if they want to get exposure, they might do it through some of these, you know, covered call type strategies that generate income on top of them. So once these options on the ETFs get approved, look for more money to be poured into the TradFi, DeFi overlap space with uh, Bitcoin ETFs and other similar products, uh, structured products, if you will. Yeah. Which is, yeah. You talked about last year's episode, Joe. Yep. Yeah, I still think that that's actually the end goal for these banks and issuers is the structured product play. I mean, Jeff, maybe you can provide a little insight from your perspective as to whether or not I'm crazy thinking that. But I know the banks make so much money off this stuff. It just feels like a no brainer. Yeah, I mean, I come from that world. Uh, I used to trade exotic option derivatives at Morgan Stanley, which sits at the center of issuing these structured products for Morgan Stanley's wealth management business. And so I literally saw how uh, these things got made. And as you all alluded to, yield is a very special word that gravitates people towards a product, no matter actually what the underlying risk may be. Now, I think there are reasons that maybe we should approach crypto <laughs> yield a little differently, but it won't matter. There are people who are just drawn to big numbers. Take, for instance, um, one of the products that YieldMax has out there called uh, MSTY. It's the micro strategy cover call strategy. And it's a phenomenal success. When you look at the distribution rate that is north of 90%, Wait, wait, let's let's take no, let's take a step back. What he's saying is <laughs> this thing is basically yeah. yielding a hundred percent, which is crazy. But go ahead, Jeff. Well, no, actually, I would, but but you got to do your homework, James, right? Because if you look at the way they define distribution and how much of it is income versus return of capital, for example, it's not very obvious to the most um, you know unsophisticated investor. But nonetheless. That number is so amazing that it has a product market fit in certain portfolios. And to your point, when the vol is that high, you can come up with all kinds of path-dependent structure payouts, and it'll create and open a door for a lot of financial product innovation. The banks love this business. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's been, that is exactly why it's been my view for so long. It's like, what is a bank's 
most number one top thing that they focus on, profit. And if there's an opportunity for them to make money, a lot of it, they're going to pursue it at any means uh, necessary to get there. And this is why I just always thought like, once the ETF got approved, I was like, options are a done deal. It's just a matter of time. And yes, there's been a lot of process and ceremony around this, but here we are. And guess who's going to benefit the most? To Jeff's point, these banks that are creating these products. That's right. That's right. Yeah, this is why I think also people misunderstand when they say these Bitcoin ETF options are not a big deal. And they'll say things like, oh, we've had derivatives all the time. We've had Ledger and we've had Deribit and we had CME. And I just tell them like, guys, those things are not what is on the backbone of this complex, this industrial complex of wealth management products and the way that it allows the biggest group of participants. Uh, and, and so I, I do think Bitcoin ETF options are separate. The same way, Bitcoin ETFs, so many people doubted that this is a product market fit because, hey, why would you buy that if you just buy it on Coinbase? It turns out, well, people do need it for all kinds of reasons, whether it's cross-asset collateralization, whether it's margining, whether it's to participate in stock lending, and you can actually lend out your ETFs and not have to worry about counterparty risk. There are useful things that come out of this financial wrapper. And so I put Bitcoin ETF options in the exact same category. It's a, it's a zero to one kind of moment. All right. Let's move on to meme coins. Alex, you had a, uh, this is Joe's favorite topic, but but Alex had a, a, a pretty long, interesting tweet this this weekend on his thoughts on meme coins. Why don't you run us through, run it through, uh, through your tweet and what you were saying and uh, we can dive into it. Yeah, it was, was just, uh, just a quick <laughs> rant, you know, written in like 90 seconds. I didn't see it till the next day. I don't know what time it was. It was midnight for you then, right? <laughs> it, it was late. Were you yeah. at the bar? Uh, no, no, no. I was just just uh, wasting time, unfortunately, on the phone. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's the, the, the thought there is uh, like like yeah, it's basically I was trying to describe how how the the ones that succeed, uh, what they have to do to basically succeed, right? And uh, one of the things they need is is to they need very strong hands at the beginning. Like uh, on meme coins, if whoever are the early the early buyers and the early holders. They have no strong hands. You are dead in the water. Uh, they also need uh, no snipers. If if you have a lot of snipers like that kicked in at the beginning, they're gonna basically dump on on the on the first waves of guys and literally send the coin to kind of zero, kill momentum, and you lose your community. So um, it was yeah, it was just like I don't think it's worth uh, going too much, putting more much more thought into that. Into it, it and that, but it's like, I th I thought it was I thought it was actually a really a really good tweet and, and articulation by pattern recognition that you've likely seen Alex through meme coins that have been successful and those that have not, which is the majority of them. I mean, right now I think it's in the range of twenty to thirty thousand new tokens are being created on just Solana every day. I mean, it's just, it's insane, right? Like ninety nine point nine percent of those those are going to be utterly worthless, which is. A whole other topic of discussion. I, I caught up with Meow, the founder of Jupiter, when I was in Salt Lake, and uh, we had some some pretty awesome conversations about how we think that there's eventually going to be one trillion tokens, and it's likely going to be because of the the kind of tokenization of of pop culture and entertainment and, and engagement. The fascinating thing that's happened over the past few days, as it relates to meme coins, which is very you know I would say consistent with Alex's tweet. Is the uh, this AI meta that's surfaced around meme coins? So I, I'm I'm not going to try to like rehash the Truth Terminal thing, but just go read on the internet what Truth Terminal is. I think actually Matt Levine at Bloomberg ended up covering it or something, right? Like this is basically a, what they call a sovereign AI. So somebody has evidently unleashed this AI model to just tweet stuff, and it created a meme coin on Solana called Goat. And I don't own any of it. I missed it. I've watched it from the sidelines and looked at it. It was like, oh my God, this is insane. This thing went up to like a four or $500 million market cap within a few days. And it had completely captured the attention of basically every peer-to-peer -peer, or excuse me, PVP-based trader uh, in, in crypto today. It was unbelievable. And then immediately after that, you just started to see more and more of these AI-based agents creating tokens, or at least that's what we think, right? Uh, this is like the watching this stuff happen 
is crazy because every single principle you were taught in business <laughs> school or risk management is completely useless in this type of an environment. And it's creating actually a new breed of traders, young adults, likely men that are just like, it's like a video game. You know, I, I remember I gave a talk at some conference in Vegas in 2019, basically comparing trading crypto to like this awesome nonstop video game. And now it's really come to fruition because people see trading meme coins as player versus player. Because if I make money, you're probably not, right? And there's so many meme coins that are always trying to capture attention that whatever the hive mind of the internet of these meme coin traders follows is where money ends up following. Like, do we really think that a cute photo of a hippo is going to maintain a billion dollar market cap for a long time? No, we don't think that. But like, there's enough holders of the token to Alex's tweet. Like if there's a big enough community and there's market makers, they want to make money on it. Like the exchange lists it, they want to make money on it. Like all this stuff becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's why I, I tend to, you know, I bucket meme coins into three categories. One is a blue chip, billion dollar market cap sustained for a reasonable amount of time. Free blue chips, 100 million to 999 million that are like on the way there, but not quite. And then the, the best, the, the fan favorite, the technical term is shitters. These are like your single digit market cap, 10, 20, 30 million dollar market cap coins that who knows what's going to happen with them. But these are effectively the lottery tickets that in some cases will capture the attention and absolutely explode in price. And you see this with a new meme coin every week. But also, you know, you see a lot of people feeling like they they missed it. And, and I would always encourage people to understand that there's going to be an infinite number of opportunities to trade meme coins because attention, content, and culture are constantly changing. And so the faster and more effective people get at tokenizing it just means that there's going to be even more of these lottery ticket type opportunities for traders out there. Uh, here, here is a, a, a thought on this uh, gold coin on, on the AI uh, meta, which is... Uh... It's actually fascinating. Um, I and I also miss it, by the way. So it's, but it's like I'm, I'm going to talk we against it. That we are not that good We're really yeah, not that no, good, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> I miss goat. <laughs> yeah, it's like that thing went up to like a 500 million market cap uh, uh, from like almost nothing in a week. But the, the what I think about goat is that this thing actually had a typo the other day, uh, two days ago. And there was a whole discussion about, okay, the typo actually indicates that it was uh, human-made. And there is uh, the other side of the story saying, well, no, it's not human-made because this, this uh, LLM is trained on, uh, say, Twitter. And because of the kind of uh, what you're feeding into the algo, it's more likely to generate typos. That's right. Personally, I don't buy that argument. I think you just basically couple that up with a, with a dictionary. I've never seen an LLM do a typo ever, and I've used it a lot. Um, so I, I think it's, it has a very big uh, human component. But that being said, it doesn't really matter. The story. Right. There's two things here. The first one is this coin, this beautiful, story, amazing story, benefit, benefit of the doubt, already very high liquidity, very high number of holders, very good distribution. So even if I don't like it and I think it's human made, the market doesn't care. And it's likely, I think it's going to do well. I'm not advocating for it. Again, I'm not long. Um, and um, there's another thought there is that the, the creator of this uh, truth terminal, he's sort of turned himself into a like, Murat type of persona right now. It's like the cult. Somebody else was talking about this, by the way, and I agree. It's kind of like it, it turned this thing into a cult already. And, and the final thought is, if you agree that this is not, even if you don't agree, uh, but uh, that this AI uh, meme coin meta, so basically an LLM plugged to Twitter, plugged into a blockchain and the, with, with wallet, in a, uh, cash in the wallet, and the ability to create uh, a coin, that's basically the, 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 the gist of it. If you... So this GOAT and all these coins coming up is not verifiably, it's not verifiable that it's fully AI. So I think we can actually expect a new meta at some point, say in the next year, where there's going to be the first 
AI meme coin that is fully verifiable that this is actually an AI. No doubt about it. I, I just want to say up. this is all like so far over. This is so dystopian in my mind. <laughs> like I'm just like this is TVP <laughs> is the perfect description. You know it's like that's the way I think about this market. It's just completely player versus player. But Jeff, you you're the head of Alpha Strategies. Do, do, do you guys in your strategies do you dabble into meme coins at all? Is there like uh, what are your what are your limits on where you can go in in your investing process? I mean, I'm just I'm too mid curve relative too. to Joe. I, I, I'm mid curve. I'm with you 100. <laughs> percent <laughs> but what I will say is actually, I wish I wish Jim Simons was still alive today because I would be so curious what he thinks about this particular phenomenon because he would be one of the spokesperson since the 90s to tell people like stock trading it doesn't matter like at the end of the day what the stock represents. It's just a thing that trades and has certain behavioral pattern. And so I make money. And if you think about that like purist approach and the application of that to the evergreen life cycle of meme coins that Joe alluded to, culture will never die. I mean, I think that's a great phrase, by the way, that Joe, you should, that actually kind of unlocks something for me to thinking about why this is a strategy that maybe everyone should learn when they're young, because if life isn't about trading some aspects of these behavioral psychology, then this might be a really good lesson for kids to learn early on. And I would bet Rentech would launch a meme coin <laughs> fund at some point. They would never tell you. You put it in a medallion and whatever, just print and mint money. But you know, I couldn't. I, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the the thing that I like when I've run quant strategies and algorithmic strategies in the past is that it's like it doesn't matter what you're trading at all, and that's meme coins. I mean, the reality is that the majority of meme coin trading, it, they're it's retail, you know, PVP traders, but the people that are making money are the ones that are running bots whether they're snipers or whether they just have the fastest RPC infrastructure or they're like, you know, finding ways of in ensuring that they get put included in the next slot for uh, the block for Solana, like whatever. That's where actually a lot of this money is. And so, you know, I don't have the, unfortunately, the bandwidth to spin up any algos to trading into this stuff. But oh my God, if I, if I was, you know, whatever, in my early 20s or a teenager and, had a, and knew how to code and saw this, it's it's a completely new world if you can programmatically trade culture. It's just never been done before. And you know, Rentech, arguably the greatest hedge fund in the history of the world in terms of performance, like they even said it doesn't matter what it is. And I think that that's lost in the discussion around meme coins because people are like, oh, it's value extractive from the user. It's like no one put a gun to anybody's head and told them to buy Mudang at the highs, right? Like no one forced them to do that. But more importantly, like it's a market and people have traded, you know, OTC pink chic stocks, like penny stocks, all kinds of shit forever. And it's not going to stop. We just now have technology where there's no way to control it. And I think that that's actually uh, fascinating. A lot of people get scared by that. I actually get excited because I have no idea what it's going to mean for, for markets going forward. All right. Um, let's wrap this up. We got to two more topics. We'll touch on them real quick. Um, Stripe. One of the largest backend fintech infrastructure plays out there. I think they're worth like $70 billion. Uh, they processed a trillion dollars in transactions last year alone. Uh, they just spent $1.1 billion on basically a stablecoin company, Bridge. One, I, I would love to know what the multiple is on that because I, I it's, it's, it seems crazy to me. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, do you, what are your guys' thoughts? I mean, obviously, all of us have on here have been saying for a long time, stablecoins is like, one area where there's definitive product market fit. It's one of the areas that we are most uh, positive on as a group. I would say there's like no disagreement there. Uh, I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? I do. I mean, I, I think, you know, full disclosure, investor in circle and think that they're, they're a great company and doing great things with stable coins. Um, I think that this is a huge signal to the broader market and even like web two companies, Silicon Valley in general, that crypto is okay, right? Stable coins are a form of crypto, whether it's, you know, it's still, that's a $1 is $1 is $1, right? But let's be clear, Stripe was pro crypto and then totally anti crypto. And then they were, now they're like, oh, we're pro crypto again. And they just acquired a stable coin company. And Stripe is Silicon Valley's canonical, like perfect fintech company, perfect startup, two brothers, 
you know, from Ireland, build this amazing developer focused company worth tens of billions of dollars, not going public, right? Like, and just keep growing the business in an amazing way. And these guys have been, uh, they're, they're incredible founders. Like, I mean, you can't take anything away from these guys, but it's, it's also like they've been almost groomed to be like the canonical, you know, startup out of Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley backed startup. And that image is very, very, very important from a signaling perspective, not only to like the broader world that Stripe is doing this, but to the investors in Silicon Valley, the kind of elite Silicon Valley tier one firms that a lot of them don't touch crypto. And now they're starting to get a sense that actually this is okay, right? I think that that's actually the most important piece here. Like Bridge is an amazing product. I was talking with Nick Carter about this uh, when I when I saw the announcement. He had mentioned something to the effect that like seemingly every startup that he that he speaks with that that you know uses stable coins in their product uses Bridge. So hats off to that team. They're awesome. Like I think it's a it's an amazing exit for them. And and being integrated into something like Stripe is huge. But like this has to be a huge win for the industry in general because when Stripe goes and acquires a company that's doing stablecoin infrastructure for other other companies and startups, and Patrick tweets something today, you know, stablecoins are a big deal, et cetera, et cetera. I'm paraphrasing. Like it's hard to be bearish on the the the, the kind of pro- progress and momentum that we're making as an industry when the bellwether of Silicon Valley is now acquiring crypto based companies. Well said. Anyone have a different view? Alex? Jeff, you have nope. any thoughts? Nope. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, it's a phenomenal thing. I, I often talk about like VC investing in crypto needing like a very barbell approach. And part of it is my own learnings of what's worked and what's not. Um, on one hand, I tell people like investing in crypto means you have to invest in like the most cutting edge, like things that are so degen that like literally just services a particular group of people, but it's it's good. Like it's a good product for that like enthusiast. And it has to be kind of like outside the system. So things that are like Tether and Tron, like they find product market fit because it's kind of outside the system. And you have to kind of lean that energy, lean into that energy a little bit. Or the other energy is you must go strictly for the very institutional, very regulated, very much like a bitwise or an anchorage or a bridge. And, and there's money there too, but maybe don't do anything in the middle. And you should ask every founder, which market are you going for, the left or the right? And if they can't tell you a straight answer, don't invest in it. And so to that point, Joe, I think I've for a long time have been a little skeptical about the right. Like we just haven't seen enough excess, right? But we've seen enormous success in Pump.Fun and Banana Gun and all these great toolings. And so to me, this is a, a day of victory, really, for that institutional VC community to also raise a flag and say, hey, we're going to make money here for you guys too. And so I'm I'm moved by it. I'm And I think, as you said, like the cultural tastemaker that Stripe is for that community is profound. And there could almost have been no better acquire for us to have a reset in that energy too. All right. Last thing, I'll just say what what are the, the World Liberty Financial did their raise, their token raise. Uh, they were targeting three hundred million dollars. For those who don't know, this is like Donald Trump's uh, son, Baron Trump, and some other people that have reskinned some code and supposed to be a DeFi application. They only raised eleven million out of three hundred million uh, that they were trying to get. So I won't say it was a failure, but it's a little bit of a flop. I, I mean, I've been on here. I've said it multiple times. I just don't get the idea of what they're doing here. Uh, personally, it just doesn't make sense to me, particularly for Trump to put his name behind something. I mean, everyone already knows he's the crypto candidate, but uh, yeah, just not surprised it didn't do too well, I guess is my own, own thought. I got I got asked uh, by a journalist last week to comment on it as to why it was so bad. And I was like, well, you don't want me to shit on Ethereum again, do you? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're not... I'm just kidding. I know I'm going to get so flamed for that. But no, I mean, honestly, it's like, it's not innovative. Like it's, it's Ave again. Like we did this five years ago, like Ave is the winner, like next, you know, and then also though, you know, this does point out a little bit of the UX challenges of getting complete utter normies to onboard. And like, if you went to the site, you had to have a web three wallet. And if you've never done crypto, but you love Trump, you're like, what the what is a Web3 wallet? There are solutions to this now. Magic, uh, I think Magic Link is one, and there's Privy and these like 
bunch of others, Dynamic. Like, there's all these other providers, Tip Link, where you can just sign in with Gmail or whatever, right? Like, there's ways of doing it. And then the other issue was the site was <laughs> down, <laughs> like, for a long time. And they're running it on Versal, which is probably the best auto scaling like hosting solution on the planet if you if you don't know what you're doing right like Guillermo is a friend of mine the CEO there like he's really smart with this stuff and like if you didn't set that configuration to just auto scale and handle all the load like I don't know I would have lost confidence if I was crypto native and came to the site it was just giving me a 500 error every time I went there for hours anyone else have thoughts I mean, not much to say there. I don't think it's very important. It, it, in a way, we could uh, see it as a negative for the space because it makes uh, Trump look like a, a lot of people talking about like like a low level grift. But that, that being said, uh, if if you want to look at the at the uh, at the other side of the coin and 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 what is positive about it is basically, uh, if he becomes president, that would basically mean. The president of the U.S. having actually uh, interest in a DeFi application, and also would bring up uh, more uh, more light, the spotlight into basically how truly complicated, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, operating on DeFi is. It truly is. So uh, it's that that is actually quite positive. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it like it. He undoubtedly is going to have people around him that know just how difficult this regulatory environment is. I mean, Bitwise could probably, he, you could probably tell stories about getting bank accounts and different things uh, over the years. It's been awful. I just think like the downside risks to him are just so much higher than the upside benefits to, to anything else. But that's just my view. Jeff, you have any thoughts? Yeah, and I agree with what Alex said. I think it's even, I mean, take away bank accounts, even just having somebody touch non-custodial solutions in a way to then imagine what the fabric of that system could look like and really usher in a dialogue. You can only know if you touch it. Now, we have sincere hope that Trump is actually touching it. He's not, of course. And like, nonetheless, you would hope that the advisors around him are actually experiencing the friction and therefore solves one of the biggest issues outstanding, which is custody. Like custody to me at Bitwise, we, we just severely feel that to be the most restricting factor. One of the reasons we went abroad to acquire ETC Group, the largest Bitcoin ETP issuer in Europe, is because the regulatory framework there is much more flexible into the interest of the investors. We can stake in Europe, right? We can't stake here. So I look at these little things that people will solve if they touch it. And so good for Trump's team for touching it. And I hope that sincerely, the hope is enthused there that they'll pay attention to it. And as a result of that, as Alex said. Uh, guys, before we, we wrap it up, something uh, that I wanted to add, that I think is interesting, uh, very briefly. There's been a lot of talk last week about um, uh, banks, unrealized losses being bigger than 2008 by, by a very large margin, margin and a lot of people uh, actually panicking about this. And uh, it's it's the way I see it is just a, a perfect example of Twitter incited paranoia that actually leads a lot of people to lose money and get out of the trade and not hold and sell their stocks or whatever because they panic for the wrong reasons. And and the gist of it is very simple: is basically yeah they're sitting on losses, unrealized losses on basically bonds that are meant to be held to maturity. And uh, because they're meant to be held to maturity, those losses, they don't feed into the balance sheet and uh, they don't affect the banks whatsoever. They're only, this would only be important if there is a uh, systemic, something really bad happens uh, exactly, and they need cash. And if that were to be the case, we get the, 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 the Fed quite likely, probabilistically, quite quickly, quickly to come in and plug whatever problem there is. So these, these uh, unrealized losses on, on held to maturity bonds, uh, it's not, and, not and, really and very if, meaningful. And if rates go the way we were, that chart I had up before, where rates are predicted to go, it's going to be a non-issue in a year, theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We went long this time. Sorry, everyone, if it's a, it's a long episode, but uh, thanks for joining us for this episode of Bits and Bips. We'll be back in two weeks to discuss more about how the worlds of crypto and macro are colliding. Thanks for joining us.